Welcome back to Deep Learning. So thanks for tuning in into the next video. What I want to show to you today are a couple of limitations of deep learning. So is it unbeatable? Has it solved all of the problems? What is working well? And where are we approaching the limits? So where are the problems of deep learning? So I hope you will enjoy this video as well. Well, of course, there are some limitations. For example, take tasks like image captioning. Here on this slide, you see really impressive results. You can see that the networks are able to identify a baseball player, a girl in a pink dress jumping in the air, or even people playing the guitar. So let's look at some errors. Here on the left, you can see this is clearly not a baseball bat. Also, there isn't a cat in the center of the image. And there are also slight errors, like the one on the right-hand side. The cat on top of the suitcases isn't actually black. Sometimes there are even really big errors, like the one here in the left image. I don't see a horse in the middle of the road. Also on the right image, there is no woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror. So the reason, of course, is that there is a couple of challenges. And one major challenge is training data. Deep learning applications require huge manually annotated data sets. And these are hard to obtain. Annotation is time consuming, expensive, and often ambiguous. So as you've seen already in the ImageNet challenge, sometimes it's not clear which label to assign. And obviously, you would have to assign a distribution of labels. Also, we can see that in the human annotations, there are typical errors. What you have to do in order to get a really good representation of the labels, you actually have to ask two or even more experts to do the entire labeling process. Then you can find out the instances where you have a very sharp peaked distribution of labels. These are typically prototypes. And broad distributions of labels are images where people are not sure. If we have such problems, then we are typically getting a significant drop in performance. So the question is, how far can we get with simulations for example, to expand training data. Of course, there are also challenges with trust and reliability. So verification is mandatory for high-risk applications, and regulators can be very strict about those. Regulators pay dis disproportionate amount of, to, of attention to that which generates press. This is just an objective fact. Um, and Tesla generates a lot of press. They really want to understand what's happening in those high-risk systems. End-to-end -end learning essentially inhibits us to identify how the individual parts work. So it's very hard for regulators to tell what part does what and why the system actually works. We must admit at this point that this is largely unsolved. It's difficult to tell which part of the network is doing what. Modular approaches that are based on classical algorithms may be one approach to solve these problems in the future. So let's look at some future directions. Something that we like to do here in Alan is learning algorithms. So for example, you can look at the classical computed tomography, which is expressed in the filtered back projection formula. You have a filter along the projection direction and then a summation over the angle in order to produce the final image. So this is a convolution and a back projection that can actually be expressed in terms of linear operators. As such, they are essentially matrix multiplications. Of course, we are building on all these um, 
great abstractions that people have invented over the millennia, such as matrix multiplications. Now those matrix multiplications can be implemented as a neural network, and you essentially then have an algorithm or a network design that can be trained for specific purposes. So here we extend this approach in order to apply to fan beam projection data. This is only a slight modification of the algorithm, and there are still cases that cannot be solved, like the limited angle situation. In this image you see a full scan, and this produces a reasonable CT image. However, if you are only missing 20 degrees of rotation, you already see severe artifacts. Now, if you take the idea of converting your reconstruction algorithm into a neural network and retrain it on some data, here only 15 images, you can see that even on unseen data we are able to recover most of the information. If you compare the two, you can see the distinct improvement. If you now look at the top part of this image, you can see that there is this reduction in mass. We show now line plots following the red line in the left image and the plots are shown on the right hand side. Now here in green you can see the reference image that is largely unaffected. As soon as you introduce the angle limitation you end up with the red curve which shows these artifacts in the top part of the image. Now if you go further ahead and take our deep learning method you end up with the blue curve which largely reduces problems that we have been introducing before by the angular limitation. Now the fun part about this is our algorithm has been inspired by a traditional CT reconstruction one. So all of the layers actually have interpretations. They are linked to a specific function. What you typically do for such a short scan is that you weigh down rays that have been measured twice such that the opposing rays exactly sum up to 1. You can see here the Parker weights in the figure. Now if we train our algorithm, the main changes are in the Parker weights. What happens is that we can see an increase of weight in particular rays that run through the area that have the angular limitation. So the network learns to use the information from a slightly different direction in those rays that have not been measured. So you can even go ahead and then combine this reconstruction method with additional de-streaking and denoising steps as we will show towards the end of this lecture in detail. As a result, we can dramatically improve also in the low contrast information. Here you see an image of the full scan reference on the top left, the neural network output on the top right that still has streak artifacts. On the bottom right you can see the output of the new de-streaking and denoising network and it's really able to reduce those streaks that have been caused by the angular limitation. Compared to just a denoising approach on the bottom left, you can see that those streaks would be diminished but they would still be present. So only a network trained to understand the problem of the angular limitation is able to actually reduce those artifacts efficiently. I already kind of think of neural nets as a kind of, of program. I think of deep learning as basically learning programs that have more than one step. So next time in deep learning, we want to look at basic pattern recognition and machine learning. Which basic rules are there? How is this in relation to deep learning? Then we want to go ahead and talk about the perceptron, which is the basic unit of a neural network. From those perceptrons, you can actually build those really deep networks that we have been featuring in this and previous videos. So I hope you also liked this video and looking forward to meeting you in the next one. Thank you very much and bye-bye.